The great Richard Feynman famously once said, If you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics operates on scales that are incomprehensible to the human brain, and exhibits strange, non-intuitive phenomena. Specifically, quantum entanglement is so non-intuitive it even gave Einstein some trouble. Before we get to entanglement though, we need some background on quantum, so here's quantum mechanics in 60 seconds. Quantum mechanics relies on the Schrodinger equation, a mathematical tool used to determine a physical system's various energy states. For instance, it helps us understand the energy levels of electrons in a hydrogen atom. These are the orbits that you usually see. This equation accounts for a system's total energy, typically including the kinetic and potential energy terms at a minimum. The potential energy term varies with the system's physical environment. Solving the Schrodinger equation yields a basis set, comprising many different wave functions that satisfy the equation. Wave functions are mathematical functions that encode the probability of measuring a particle in a specific state. The specific wave functions that we get from solving the Schrodinger equation are known as eigenstates, and return the same function with a multiplier when plugged back into the equation's left-hand side. This multiplier represents the energy associated with that wave function. Finding these eigenstates is crucial in quantum mechanics, as the energy measured in experiments corresponds to the energy of these states. While eigenstates are very useful, any function that satisfies the Schrodinger equation of our system is a valid state. For instance, combining two eigenstates through addition remains a valid solution to the equation. This is known as superposition, and is a fundamental concept in quantum mechanics. Alright, now that we have some background in quantum mechanics, let's go to entanglement. I just explained that we can solve the Schrodinger equation for a single physical system, but entanglement is a phenomenon that occurs when multiple quantum systems, which in this case we'll call A and B, interact with one another. When dealing with the quantum state of multiple systems, we can still solve the Schrodinger equation, but there is a distinction based on separability. When the Schrodinger equation is separable, we can separate the contributions from systems A and B into their own mathematical terms, and then solve them separately. In a non-separable system, we cannot do this because there is some mathematical term that we can't factor out. Separable systems typically exhibit no entanglement, while non-separable ones may demonstrate varying degrees of entanglement. The key to discovering entanglement lies in creating non-separable systems in real-world scenarios. To do that, we need to build up a little bit more intuition about how the Schrodinger equation works. Remember, the Schrodinger equation is just a mathematical tool for predicting a system's energy states, and it really represents the total energy in a system. To generate entangled states, we require the total energy to depend on the interaction between systems. This necessitates an interaction term in the Schrodinger equation, a potential energy component contingent upon the systems interacting. Okay, but I've only kicked the can down the road here. The question, how do we create one of these non-separable systems, has just become, how do we add an interaction term into our Schrodinger equation? Luckily for us, this question is a little easier to answer. Adding an interaction term in our Schrodinger equation is as simple as adding an interaction in the real world. All we need is physically strong interactions between the two systems that we're describing with the math. For instance, if we can find two electrons in a box and call one of the electron system A and the other electron system B, their mutual repulsion generates an interaction term in the Schrodinger equation. Consequently, the problem can no longer be separated into components that solely depend on the individual electrons. There will always be an inseparable term with dependence on both electron A and electron B together. This concept isn't just limited to two boring electrons either. Here's a quick list of ways to generate entangled particles. Entangled pairs of photons can be generated by shooting a single photon at a special type of nonlinear crystal. Superconducting qubits can be entangled by connecting them by a waveguide, allowing them to pass microwave photons between one another. Neutral atoms can be entangled by exciting one of a pair suspended in optical tweezers into its high-energy Rydberg state. Nuclear spins can be entangled in an NMR or MRI experiment, they're basically the same thing, through the spin's magnetic interaction. All of these cases, and many others where entanglement is generated, are very physically different but they all come from the basic same principles of non-separability, causing the system states to be inextricably linked. But what do these entangled states look like? Well, consider superconducting qubits connected by a resonator, allowing them to interact. Alone, the qubits can be in the zero state, the one state, or a superposition of the zero and the one state. 
By making them interact, we can create entangled states. One such example is this bell state. In this specific entangled state, if qubit 1 is 0, qubit 2 is also. If qubit 1 is 1, qubit 2 is also. But crucially, we don't know which state the pair is in until we measure. So our system is in a superposition of two possibilities. But note here that the combination 0, 1 and 1, 0 do not appear. That's because the system is entangled and the state of the second qubit is completely determined by the state of the first. If you want to learn more about the specifics of superconducting qubits, check out this video I did delving into the specifics of how they work. If you're more interested in how to actually program a quantum computer, stay tuned, because I've got a video on that in the works. Until next time, I've been Lucas, this has been Lucas's Lab, and thanks for watching.